the G20 summit has just concluded in India. It has been a mega event. It was very well choreographed. The amazing thing is that very few people were expecting that we would have a New Delhi declaration emerging from this summit. Everyone thought that in this era of such sharp polarizations between nation states with Russia and China staying away, there would be no consensus and we would have to satisfy ourselves with a summary of the chair. That's about all the kind of consensus that we could get. But to everybody's amazement, on the very first day of the summit itself, we had a consensus document, we had a New Delhi declaration, where all countries of the world came on one page. In that 37-page document, there were 120 significant outcomes. Normally, the outcomes are just about 30 to 40 in every G20 meet. But here, there were uh, almost 120, uh, you know, outcomes that were recorded here. And the other facet is that uh, despite the sharp cleavages due to the Russia-Ukraine war, there were seven paragraphs devoted to the Russia-Ukraine war, none of which mentioned Russia by name. And yet, it satisfied, you know, the requirements of Europe, of United States, of America, and all the nations. And that the very fact that we were able to have a New Delhi declaration, a consensus document, is tribute to India's as a consensus maker, as a bridge builder across countries, across sharp polarized divides. It is a tribute to the Indian ability to cement nation states, to bring them together, to nourish unity in as opposed to sharp divisions and uh, differences. The most significant outcome of the uh, G20 uh, meeting in New Delhi was the African Union was included as the 21st member of the G20. Now, this gives representations to about 1.4 billion uh, population of Africa. It gives them a voice as part of the Global South. And India emerged as the voice of the Global South. India emerged as the consensus builder who would enlarge the table for more and more countries to participate, take part in the decision making rather than it being a top-down approach with a few uh, Western nations dominating the discourse. The other most critical facet, like I said, was the agreements on establishing the India, Middle East, Europe corridor, the spice route as it is being called. This is a sea and rail uh, routes which will be constructed with, with contributions from India, the United States, about $500 million each, $1 billion kitty is being set up. Then the Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Israel, and then in Europe, France and other nations will join up to facilitate and help the creation of this major trade corridor which will enhance global trade connectivities. There will not just be a railway line, there will be a hydrogen pipeline. There will be an information highway, a very high capacity information highway that will go along uh, this entire uh, corridor. This will increase trade by about 40%, enhance the existing levels of trade between India, Middle East and Europe by over 40%. And this will also, you know, uh, uh, create new opportunities for trade and uh, transcontinental linkage, reduce the price of energy, the flows of energy out of uh, uh, the Middle East to India and to other destinations. The next corridor is the Trans-Africa Corridor. So we will have a Trans-Africa Corridor which will span Angola, Katanga and Zam, uh, you know, Zambia 
to the other side the copper mines they will all be linked and enhance uh, you know trade and connectivity in africa so these are the two major outcomes the other areas that were focused upon was primarily climate change now here we went about just pious intentions and you know uh, uh, statements which are made every year in g20 after g20 but nothing is done so india focused on deliverables concrete actions like financial uh, commitment that have been promised to g20 by the developed nations india has uh, stressed that these must financial commitments must be met then india has increased the level of uh, you know uh, transition to green energies and to reduce carbon footprints by 30 to 40% increase the targets they have also india has stressed upon achieve, achieving the goals of sustainable the sustainable development goals sdgs as they are called in a more meaningful in a more concrete fashion then india has worked in a major way on reforming the multilateral banks like the world bank the uh, multilateral national uh, multi mnf world bank etc Uh, reforming these banks restructuring these banks in a way that they can maximize their uh, disbursement of loans to developing countries help in the process of development help in the process of establishment of trade corridors you know uh, even harness private finance for these uh, international developmental goals uh, uh, so this is uh, called for major restructuring of these uh, multilateral banking institutions then there is the aspect of cryptocurrency india and the other countries of the world will uh, sort of have decided to come together and to establish a rule based order as far as cryptocurrency is concerned so that uh, you know we can uh, uh, we don't force it underground we don't force a kind of a black net on cryptocurrency but make it uh, legal tender make it uh, uh, you know uh, manageable and uh, more controllable by the rest of the world by global uh, authorities by global uh, uh, you know groupings another major facet that india focused on was debt relief you know the major problem has been with this very highly touted belt road initiative of china on which a conference is going to take place in beijing shortly you know they have done it with very narrow selfish country centric aims to make profit they have imposed a very heavy debt burden on the nations which have become part of this belt road initiative where the chinese have created these projects the simple fact is the entire workforce that works on these uh, belt road initiatives of china whether in pakistan whether in uh, africa whether in uh, sri lanka etc they don't use the labor the local labor therefore they don't provide economic opportunities to the local people the entire workforce comes from china and the money is all earned by china apart from that is the very high debt which they charge which has been driving country after country to bankruptcy we have the clear illustration of sri lanka a thriving economy has been driven to absolute meltdown and bankruptcy by the chinese uh, so called aid which they got with such high rates of interest which have put countries into debt traps sri lanka has had to give the hambantota port on lease for 100 years similarly pakistan is in a serious debt trap its economy is in a state of meltdown because the chinese uh, model of bri is extremely exploitative colonial in outlook it is based upon usury extremely high rates of interest which have been destroying the economies of nations instead of helping them so uh, you know structuring debt relief for nations which are so oppressed by these heavy debt burden that has also been one of the aims of 
the G20 summit meeting that we had. Now the other aspect that India stressed on are universal values. Instead of focusing strongly on national interest, instead of focusing on GDP centric growth, we have tried to widen the concept to human centric growth. Now it is this which has helped in the process of bridge building, in the process of consensus making because had we focused on narrow self-interest, national self-interest, national uh, economic prosperity at the cost of other nations like the Chinese BRI model, uh, we would not have been able to do the bridge building that we have been able to do in India. We focused on the Indian ethos of Vasudhev Kutumbakam, one world, one family, one future. Now these are slogans that stress universality as opposed to narrow national self-interest which lead to competition and you know uh, competitive uh, you know uh, races, competitive commerce that beggars economies of other nations and your own nation. Instead of those uh, narrow nation centric values, we have stressed global values, the whole world as one family, one world, one family, one future. Now this global outlook was commented upon adversely by China which objected to use of the term Vasudev Kutumbakam in a very uh, churlish manner. But uh, that was, uh, you know, that did not prevent India achieving a, a very commendable degree of uh, success in terms of building a global consensus on issues of global importance. You see, India stressed on lifestyles that promote global health, that promote the health of the planet. We think in planetary terms and therefore the lifestyles that we adopt are far closer to nature. Now India is regarded as a civilization of the forest, just as the Middle East is the civilization of the desert, Saudi Arabia, Oman, Muscat, etc. India is the civilization of the dense forest, where man lives in great, uh, you know, symbiotic union with nature. And the values that are stressed are not so much the Darwinian values of competition and conflict between species, but the values of collaboration, cooperation, symbiotic uh, linkages between the various species of the planet, be between various life forms on planet earth, uh, to develop lifestyles that are sustainable. You cannot have linear growth because linear growth is non-sustainable. Linear growth leads to logical cul-de-sacs. Linear growth is like the dinosaurs. Nature had to intervene to wipe the dinosaurs out. So India has, as a civilization, has always stressed this, uh, you know, feeling of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, one world, one family, one future. Also, you know, Sarve Santu Niramayaha, Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha, Sarve Santu Niramaya. Let the whole world be happy. Let all living beings be happy. Let all living beings be free of disease. Now, this is the universal values of the Indic civilization, which uniquely qualify the Indic civilization to promote uh, harmony at the global planetary scale, to promote uh, cooperation, uh, collaboration, symbiotic linkages across the world, across the planet. And we have been talking of lifestyles in harmony with nature. And a yoga is a lifestyle that aims at wellness, wellness of the mind, wellness of the body, wellness of the spirit. And it has, you know, really caught on. It has become so popular globally. And it is also becoming a kind of an industry. Uh, the, you know, India has been promoting this wellness, uh, you know, aspects of yoga globally as a kind of a global movement. So, a uh, movement to, uh, you know, uh, live in harmony with nature can only come from a civilization of the forest 
like the Indian civilization, like the Indic civilization with its values of harmony, symbiosis, cooperation and collaboration as opposed to competition and conflict. You know, the Charles Darwinian view is uh, that there is a struggle for survival. There is a struggle to just live and the bigger animal just eat the smaller animals. The weak must perish. They cannot survive. All this leads to conflict. All this leads to competition, which is self-destructive. And we find the Charles Darwinian conflict has infected our industry, our commerce, our geopolitics, and which has brought the world to the present very sorry state, which has led to global warming, destruction of the symbiotic chains in nature, the linkages in nature. And now if the, the global temperature warming goes up by two degrees, our uh, planetary uh, survival is at stake. It's becoming a big, big question mark. Because global warming will lead to a melting of the polar ice caps, will lead to a rise in the sea levels, will, reach, will lead to the sinking of micro island states like the Maldives, Malay, etc., Mauritius. They will all go down under the sea, which will create climate refuges. It will lead to the inundation of coastal areas in Bangladesh. Again, a whole flood of climate refugees will be unleashed. It will seed chaos and uh, the ozone layer is being depleted. You know, the, 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 the global warming is a recipe for global disaster. The glaciers are melting in the Himalayas. It will lead to great degrees of water stress and it could lead to water wars just like we had in the last century, oil wars. Because oil was a scarce resource, so the whole world was competing for it, fighting for it, waging wars to secure oil. We may be fighting wars in this century to secure sources of water at the rate at which the glaciers are melting. So India has focused attention on these. India has focused attention on sustainable development goals for a change. India has also focused in a major way on a global energy transition. The world simply has to move on from fossil fuels. You see, nature took billions of years to fix the carbon from the atmosphere onto the, onto the earth, onto the soil, into the rocks, etc. and fix, put it underground in terms of these reserves of uh, oil, shale, natural gas, etc. But if in just one century, we will unburn all this carbon back, the fossil fuel back. We will, we will unfix the carbon from the earth's surface and send it back into the atmosphere and to create global warming on a planetary scale which will destroy life on the planet, threaten all life and growth on this planet. So we have to envision now an energy fuel, an energy future sans fossil fuels. We have to get over mankind's fix on cheap fossil fuels which have been proving so destructive to our environment. What are the ways out? We, the world is talking now of uh, the hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen initiative. India is leading the pack in this particular technology. India is doing a hell of a lot to create, you know, hydrogen as the fuel currency of the future. The, the tendency is to shift from oil to natural gas and ultimately to hydrogen. We are talking of green fuels, biofuels like ethanol and methanol and blends of ethanol and methanol with, uh, uh, with oil. Uh, we, we already have a whole range of vehicles which are based on blended fuels. And the Indian, uh, you know, uh, uh, transport minister, Mr. Gadkari, has spoken, has envisioned an India which will be free of fossil fuels entirely. India's greatest problem is that we lack fossil fuels. We have to import 70 to 80 percent of our oil and natural gas. We have coal, but these are very shallow mines. 
and if we start using that coal we burn it into the atmosphere it will be a major major source of pollution we can't afford we have to transition from fossil fuels we have to go to natural gas we have to go to hydrogen we have to go to nuclear we have to go in a very major way for solar wind biomass and we have to go for a triad of these there are some view points that talk of a triad of solar biomass and wind and this triad you know there are some uh, you know uh, uh, you know hypothesis which state that india's 650000 villages must become energy sufficient using this triad of local energies solar wind biomass and then instead of massive grids which lead to great amount of inefficiencies and losses in the grid we go in for a distributed grid massive distributed grids where each village generates its own uh, sources of local power uh, though india has uh, connected the last village electrified the last village is getting piped water to the last village but uh, we have to now think in terms of transiting to an absolutely new energy f- future beyond uh, the fossil fuels we have to go to nuclear energy we have to go to hydrogen green hydrogen clean hydrogen we have to go to biofuels ethanol methanol etc and india is leading the this thing and we unveiled the biofuel alliance during the course of the g20 india is also talking in terms of boosting bio smart agriculture we have to ensure nutritional security food security for all and to that extent we have to go for local grains you know the monoculture of wheat and cotton etc that is Uh, destructive degrades the environment we have to think of uh, other alternative food uh, food grains like millets and india has gone in for a very very major way for going for millets and uh, especially in the g20 uh, our chefs went out of the way to uh, introduce uh, millet as the source of so many kinds of different foods and uh, you know victuals for the guests who had come to this g20 another major initiative of india where india tried to showcase its tremendous digital public infrastructure that it has created it is this digital public infrastructure that generates you know financial inclusion the you know government given subsidies we had this jan dhan account yojana we created millions of new bank accounts we took the banking to the villages to almost the last mile connectivity and now government subsidies you know which when they were being given in the old fashioned way disbursed manually there were so many sources of leakages that rajiv gandhi had said out of a rupee only about 15 paisa needs uh, reaches the desired recipients but now the government has ensured that with digital public infrastructure and digital inclusion we have achieved financial inclusion we have been able to send you know uh, the government subsidies to the last man in the last village and as the world bank chief said this could have would have taken uh, decades to really achieve otherwise but what india has achieved with digital financial infrastructure is praiseworthy we have pulled another 200 million indians out of the below poverty line brought them up to the middle class uh, status and the indian economy is now becoming an engine for global growth we are the only economy which is going at 7 um, uh, percent plus rates of gdp growth which are likely to grow even more the nifty has reached uh, 20000 mark the other sensex has gone to 67000 it is unprecedented it is giving the world hope the world which had suffered a double whammy firstly from covid and then from the russia ukraine war which severely impacted uh, 
uh, fuel prices, gas prices, oil prices, fertilizer prices and food prices. It had given a double whammy, a double jolt to the global economy and almost pushed it to the level of recession. Now, thanks to global growth engines like India, we are now staging a recovery. We are leading the recovery at the global level. Very smartly, India used this G20 to carry out a major soft power projection campaign of India as a tourist destination in the post-COVID era. We had about 1 lakh delegates from 120 countries that we had invited. No G20 has ever been done at this scale. We held 200 of these meetings, not in Delhi and the metropolises of either Mumbai or uh, Bangalore, but we held them in 60 different cities of India. It was to promote the beauty of the Indian landscape, the beauty of Indian architecture. And we tried to promote one district, one product. We tried to showcase India as a tourist destination, as an economic investment destination. And uh, I think this was a very creditable uh, tourism promotion exercise, trade promotion exercise, uh, commerce promotion exercise, and which showcased the beauty of the Indian environment to the whole world and also the India's historical heritage. As part of our, our soft power projection, we also, we also promoted and showcased India's democracy, India's demographic advantage. It is the youngest population in the whole world. And look at our digital literacy. You see, it is the uh, the largest democracy in the whole world it has the largest demography the the youngest population in the whole world and we also showcased our diversity and our incredible level of development the incredible level of infrastructure creation that we have undertaken is unprecedented in the globe the amount of thousands and thousands of kilometers of excellent roads that we have added, the railway lines that we have added, the metro trains that we have added, the fast trains that we have added, the, uh, you know, Vande Bharat expresses that now crisscross the subcontinent. And, uh, you know, when we enhance connectivity, we enhance trade, we enhance, uh, you know, uh, inter-regional connectivities, within the country, we boost, give a tremendous boost to the economy and to tourism and to trade and to development. India tried to promote a global attitude where we nourish unity over diversity and discord. We, we promote global planetary unification with the slogan, one world, one family, one future. That, I think, has been one of the greatest soft power projection exercises undertaken in recent times, which has worked so well. It is this soft power, you know, basis, which has enabled India to become such a significant consensus builder, bridge builder. I think kudos are due. Uh, one is deeply impressed by the performance of the Indian Foreign Ministry and especially our Sherpas, Mr. Amitabh Kant and his team, which burnt midnight oil to secure a consensus, which created 15 drafts of the Delhi Declaration document to satisfy, you know, and to gain consensus across such terrible, you know, discord and polarization that exists in the world today, especially, you know, in the wake of COVID and then with the Russia-Ukraine war and the looming conflicts in Taiwan, in Korea and, uh, you know, Azerbaijan, Armenia and elsewhere. I mean, the world has never been so sharply polarized as it is today.